Now recall when we look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 15 through 18, that this is a passage that the apostle, if Paul is the writer, is trying to tell the Jews, uh, excuse me, uh, if New Testament Christians are going to learn from this passage, this is applicable to us in the sense that under the New Testament, we're able to have our sins forgiven. There's no more offering for sins. And because of this, uh, we're able to uh, attain salvation in Jesus Christ. Now, there's a second application to this, because remember, the book of Hebrews is a transitional epistle. A transitional epistle will divide with tribulation saints, as mentioned, as I mentioned before, and the, and, excuse me, and New Testament Christians. So, we've seen the definition, uh, we've seen the explanation for New Testament Christians in that passage. Bound by that New Covenant, or New Testament, that the Lord Jesus Christ did. But remember, within this New Covenant, from the New Testament, it has two sides where, these can refer to Jews as well as New Testament Christians. Now, this is the book of Hebrews. Remember that? If it is Hebrews, and remember in Hebrews chapter 1 that it is referring to the tribulation timeline, then that means there's going to be a tribulation application very likely. So, if we were to look at verse 5, so look at that passage again, all right? So we know, again, this is the covenant, right, that God makes anew where he doesn't recall their sins and they can have forgiveness. We get that as New Testament Christians, but how can that refer to Jews in the tribulation? Remember, that passage, let me repeat again, is repeated from Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews 8, where God said, I will put my laws in your hearts and then your sins and iniquities will I remember no more. That is for Jews in the millennium. That is not during the tribulation timeline. This is for a national salvation, not individual salvation. But in this passage, there is no doubt, no matter how you're going to look at it, verse 15 through 18 is an individual salvation. That's an individual salvation. We see that for New Testament Christians, not a problem. But then for the Jews, that's not going to really work out if it's going to be millennium, right? So then we see right here how the Apostle Paul, look at this now, he takes a passage from a millennium, and this can go through three different applications then. See that? There is no doubt when you look at Hebrews 8, and Hebrews 10, it, there's a difference. This is an individual at Hebrews 10. Hebrews 8 is national. So there's a clear, stark difference. So recall what I mentioned to you at previous teaching. Previous teaching, Paul's method, or actually the right biblical method, is dividing, right? Amen. So the proper method in biblical hermeneutics or interpretation of the Word of God is to divide a verse. And when you divide a verse in the Bible, the huge key when you're handling one verse is that one verse can have multiple applications. So if you keep this picture in mind, about one verse can have multiple applications, then it can be a lot more understandable when you read that book. Because then you're going to see things that doesn't really make sense. So if you look at uh, the easiest evidence is this. You don't even have to be dispensational. You don't even have to divide verses. If you're going to go by no normally what Bible commentators look at Hebrews 8, and Hebrews 10, I mean, we looked at Hebrews 8, right? That's national in scope, national in context. Can we agree with that? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's clearly no doubt. He said, house of Israel, house of Judah. This is some national thing. And when you compare that, so when you look at that context, it is no doubt the author, he knows Old Testament verses. 
where God promised the nation of Israel who is divided and broken, they'll be united again and that he put them in a clock. He put them on a time period where he's going to uh, give them national forgiveness of sins. There is no doubt about that. And I don't have to explain that at Hebrews chapter 8. But when you look at Hebrews 10, there is no national context here. And this is not some kind of delayed time period that God puts on a schedule of your forgive, you're going to receive forgiveness of sins uh, at this national clock, this national calendar that I set up. No, he, he doesn't do that in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10 is immediate. When you look at that verse 15 through 18, you can immediately get that forgiveness of sins in Hebrews 10, 15 through 18. But in Hebrews 8, there is clearly no doubt that's on a calendar, a postponement, a time clock. That's a national forgiveness of sins for Israel. So even if you're not dispensational, if you're an honest person reading the context of the verses, then you would see right here, there is no doubt an individualistic context in Hebrews 10 versus a national context at Hebrews 8. All right, do we agree so far? Do we understand so far? Okay, so bottom line is that Hebrews 10 is an individual salvation. So understanding that all of this is individual salvation, then we see a further division. The further division is that it can go to tribulation Jews and New Testament Christians. How do we know that? Because I told you a long time ago at Hebrews 1, which I'm not going to do again. Remember, when you look at the book of Hebrews, the audience you want to keep in mind is a transitional audience, not one audience in one time period. It's a transitional audience. Because remember, the background is during a transitional time when the Apostle Paul, he is writing, he is writing at a time period where Jews were still being ministered to and Jews were uh, hearing tribulation doctrine from the apostles and Jesus Christ. But at the same time, he is being introduced New Testament Christian doctrine. The author Paul, though, he does not know clearly what's going on because all he's doing is he's just receiving information from God. He's receiving information from God, so he doesn't know the same mindset as God does. Remember, God is the ultimate author of the book of Hebrews, not the Apostle Paul. God, being the ultimate author, can see that this book, I can have it read by tribulation saints during the tribulation time period, but in my genius way, I can also have this read for New Testament Christians as well. Why? Because God, when you read his books, he can apply a book of the Bible where anybody from any time period could take something and doctrinally apply to themselves. So that's how, remember, that's a dimensional application within dispensationalism. Now, all of this was already explained from Hebrews chapter 1 through Hebrews chapter 4. I'm not uh, doing it again. I'm just refreshing your memory here, okay? Amen. So now let's take it for granted we understand that. So two audiences. We understand the audience for New Testament Christians. I explained that last Hebrews class. Now let's come to tribulation Jews. How is that going to apply to them? The idea is then they themselves, just like New Testament Christians, they can receive the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of their sins. So they are able to receive that promise. However, if you recall in our previous Hebrew study at chapter 4 and I think 5 and 6, remember, tribulation saints, they receive the application of the blood differently from New Testament Christians. So remember, for New Testament Christians, how we're applied the blood is that we ourselves are washed. Yeah. We're in passive tense. We are washed. However, the tribulation Jews recall that they have to wash themselves, wash themselves in the blood of Christ. So we can see here that there is a works system versus a non-work system. New Testament Christians, that's not a surprise. We 
uh, have no works involved for our salvation. But during the tribulation timeline for tribulation Jews, they definitely have to do a lot of works. And that was already given in our previous Hebrews class. But recall, the verses are Hebrews, uh, Revelation chapter 12, and even Hebrews chapter 10 itself, when, you, when we're going to hit verse 29, all right? So we're going to eventually see that. They have to keep washing themselves in the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. It's not like they're washed by Jesus himself, and that's permanent. No, they have to constantly wash themselves in the blood of Christ. So we'll see that eventually, all right, at Hebrews 10, 29. Uh, but the verses, again, to establish this is Revelation 12 and Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Now we're going to uh, look at verse 19, verse 19. Oh, by the way, I just want to add this one note. So this is a great proof that you can use against mid-acts or hyper-dispensationalists. Now, mid-acts and hyper-dispensationalists, they might argue against yours truly from last Hebrews class about taking a passage in Hebrews 10, 15 through 18, and if you recall what I told you, Hebrews 10, 15 through 18 is dispensationally for the millennium, right? Yeah. But notice how the author of Hebrews didn't care about that. He wasn't being a hyper-dispensationalist and said, oh, I can't use this passage because that's for the millennium. No, he used that for New Testament Christians. So a New Testament Christian can get a doctrinal application from an Old Testament passage. Yeah. That's a great victory against mid-acts hyper-dispensationalism. But they might argue against yours truly saying, no, 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 this is for Hebrews. Remember, the book is Hebrews and that is for tribulation. So this passage is for tribulation Jews. It still does not change the fact that the apostle, if it's Paul who wrote the book of Hebrews, that the author of Hebrews, whoever the author is, he took an Old Testament millennium passage. He took an Old Testament millennium passage, not a tribulation passage. The author here, he deliberately Remember what I mentioned last Hebrews class, he quoted verse 16, 17, 18, but he neglected one verse when you go back to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 11. Remember that? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 11. He chopped off that part. He applied verse 12, he applied uh, verse 10, but he dropped verse 11. Look at that. The author of Hebrews quoted verse 10 and verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 8 for Hebrews 10, but he skipped verse 11. Why? Because verse 11 won't work. Because tribulation Jews, they have to spread their gospel throughout all the world. But in Hebrews 8, 11, you're not supposed to tell anybody about the Lord. That don't make sense. Why? Because Hebrews 8, 11 is for millennium. Because in the millennium, no one tells anybody about knowing the Lord. Remember I taught you that in the last Hebrews class? You actually get stabbed, all right? You actually get stabbed. Max Ramirez and Jonathan Vaughn would have died a long time ago in the millennium. All right, they get stabbed in the millennium for witnessing to souls. In the millennium, that's the case because everybody knows God. Because God is ruling over all the world in the millennial kingdom. Everybody knows who's, who's the boss that time. Right now, they don't. And especially during the tribulation, they don't. The devil is the one controlling the scene. So tribulation Jews have to spread their gospel throughout all the world, help them know the Lord. So notice that the author of Hebrews himself, knowing that dispensationally it's millennium, he still applied it anyway for tribulation Jews. So how is mid-Acts going to go around that? So here's the mid-acts mentality. If there's a verse that is for a different time period, then people cannot claim that verse doctrinally for themselves. That's only a half-truth. That's only a half-truth. Because at times, yes. But at other times, no. Oh, yeah. Other times, no. Because we've seen in this case right here, the author of Hebrews took a verse from a millennium time period and applied it for tribulation Jews. And if Mid-Acts believe this is for tribulation Jews, how are they going to answer that? So you can get doctrinal application from another verse from a different time period. And I mean doctrinal. 
doctrinal application. So Medaks are still very dishonest people. They still don't know much Bible. You know all the Bible they know? All they know is ju 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 and cut, 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 divide. That's all they know. That, they act like they know so much Bible because they got deeper into dispensationalism, unlike you guys. So you don't know much Bible like they do. No, that shows their amateurish knowledge. They're so amateur that if they see something that uh, doesn't make sense to them, they just chop it off. They don't do the honest part about looking at the entirety of context or scripture with scripture and see what God sees. A holistic perspective will show actually verses can be harmonized or God can make double applications. They don't do that. And by the way, we divide more than hypers anyway if they think that they divide more deeply than we do. No, we divide more. Notice right here that in this case, we chopped off Hebrews 8, 11 and applied that for millennium, but taking Hebrews 8, 10 and 12 and applied that for Hebrews 10. Hyper-dispensationalists aren't as hard workers in being dispensational or dividing like we are. So mid have a very arrogant, prideful issue that you have to watch out for that is very uh, attractable to Bible believers who do get into dispensationalism. So I do want to warn people, if you hear mid if you hear about uh, like Berean, or if you hear about grace, 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 type of churches, then that's a huge red flag that you want to stay away from, all right? Those are mid ax people. They are a dangerous group of people, especially if they start teaching that Christians do not practice water baptism or do not confess their sins under the blood, all right, for fellowship. When they do that, then you know you're in heresy land and you want to stay away, Amen. okay? Amen. Now let's go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. Hebrews 10 verse 19. Oh, by the way, for tribulation Jews, yeah, they have to spread their gospel. That's found in Matthew 24. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24. And then notice right here that during the tribulation timeline, they have to spread their gospel throughout the whole world. The Bible says in verse 13, Matthew 24, 13, the context is tribulation, right, because of uh, verse 21, right? 21 is tribulation. So Matthew 24 is about tribulation. But look at verse 13. Doesn't this sound like the book of Hebrews? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Right? Hold fast, enduring to the end. Remember, that's what the book of Hebrews is about. Mm -hmm. The end, the end, the end. All right. And this gospel of the kingdom, see that there? That's the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in what? All the nations for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. How about that? So notice that they have to tell people about knowing the Lord. Yeah. Then they should have been stabbed, according to Hebrews chapter 8. But the author divided Hebrews 8, 11, and applied that for millennium, and then took 9 and 10, uh, 10 and 12 for tribulation. All right, Amen. let's go back. Let's go back. Hebrews chapter 10 and then verse 19. I think people really don't understand this. The, the problem with anti-dispensationalists and hyper-dispensationalists is they don't understand this one thing. This is one rule you want to keep in your mind, guys. That way you don't mess up in heresy. That way you know you're in Bible-believing dispensationalism. What's the one rule? The one rule is when God gives a statement, when God gives a verse, he can see multiple time periods, multiple people within that one statement. And if you don't know that, you really don't know Bible. There is absolutely no doubt about it because God is without time. He's not bound by time. So when he works, when he gives a statement, he can see multiple things, time periods going on within that one statement. How can, uh, to, to, Make that statement only one time period, only one. Then what you're doing is you're, uh, you are disgracing God's omnipresence, God's infinity, which is his uh, perfect attribute of without time. You are bound by time. That's why you have to put a time period there in the verse. But God is not bound by time, so don't make him bound by time. Amen. 
That's the problem with anti-dispensational and hyper-dispensationalists. They take a verse and apply it to one time period. Anti-dispensationalists will apply it to Christians entirely or first century Christians or first century Christianity. And then you get the hypers who just apply, jump it to Jews in tribulation. And then all you got left is 12 little books of Paul and this is all your promises of God right here. That's your Bible, you know? This blessed old booklet that I hold in my hand. You might as well sing like that then. How can hyper dispensationalists sing, I love the old Bible, the precious old Bible? They have to cut it like this. That's where their promises are claimed. All right, let's go to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, and then verse 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, as flesh. Okay, remember, I'll be explaining each and every word here. So see if my explanations match up with those two verses. Basically, Paul is saying, that's why, brethren, my brethren, we do have boldness. We got the courage to enter into the holy of holies. And recall that is up in heaven itself. That was the whole context of Hebrews 4 through 10. How we get over there is through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have the boldness, and that's a new and a living way, he says. That's what Jesus Christ consecrated that new and living way for us. Remember, consecration is to separate from sin and put it into holiness, but to commit it and dedicate it there. So Jesus Christ put that new and living way of the blood. He put a commitment there that it will be separated from sin and is set aside for holiness. This new and living way that he consecrated through us is actually the veil that you want to keep in mind. So notice here, tribulation Jews and New Testament Christians can receive the washing of the blood. And this washing of the blood is made a new and living way. This is a new and living way. This new and living way is consecrated. It's dedicated. And that is the veil. Why is he calling that the veil? Because remember, the Holy of Holies is where again? It's up in heaven. So because the Holy of Holies is up in heaven, I don't think they can really read these words, so I'll stop drawing and writing in red, I guess. Yeah. Okay, it's somewhat visible. All right then. Okay. Now this Holy of Holies, recall, is up in heaven itself. If this Holy of Holies is up in heaven itself, then how are you going to enter, right? When you enter heaven itself through the Holy of Holies, that's why Paul uses the language and calls it veil. This veil is, remember, entrance. So that's why Paul uses that wording. But this is even more so, the reason why I'm emphasizing this is, it is amazing here. This veil, this entrance into heaven, is actually what the author, look at that verse, he says that is his flesh. That's Jesus' body. That is the flesh of Jesus Christ himself. The flesh of Jesus Christ himself is that veil. So then, how are you going to picture that? Is it literally Jesus Christ is like up in heaven and then you go inside him and stuff like that? I think spiritually that is possible, but that's not the kind of picture that I'm trying to give to you physically. The idea is this. It's some kind of spiritual transaction that takes place that is connected to Jesus' body. First of all, go to Matthew 27. Matthew 27. Now you can guess about the veil when you're thinking about Jesus Christ's death or his blood. When you're thinking about the veil, what comes to mind about Jesus Christ's death and his blood? You, you, you might think about, yes, the, the veil that was rent in twain from top to bottom, right? So think about this. Why would God tear the veil in the Holy of Holies on earth for no good reason at all unless there is some reason there that you and I have to discover. 
So think about that. What's the reason for that veil being torn? So let's look at Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27. And we know what happened here. The Bible reads at verse 51, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Go to John 19. John 19. Well, let's think about it this way. The answer then, why God would tear the veil from top to bottom, can only be Hebrews 10, which we looked at. In Hebrews 10, the Bible says the veil is his flesh. So Hebrews 10 gave us the greatest clue. Yeah. What happened to Jesus' flesh? Ah, John 19, it was split. He got a pierce on his side. There was a hole there, an opening there. John chapter 19, without a bone broken too. How about that? So then think about this. His bone was not broken, but he had to be pierced. Why would God do that? For no good reason, unless there is a good reason. That's something, ain't it? God has a reason. All that ties beautifully to Hebrews 10 then. That would make sense. So if we go to John chapter 19... And then verse 30, uh, 34, 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that what he saith is true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. What? A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they what? Pierced. pierced. So... Now, look at John 10. Doesn't this make more sense? Go to John 10. When you want to go to heaven one day, and you and I are going to literally go up to heaven when he calls us home at the rapture. When we go up there, we have to go through the door. And who is the door? Who calls himself the door? Jesus Christ. Yeah, he's the entrance. That's why it makes sense. It's the body of Jesus. That is that entrance up to heaven. Oh, that's something, ain't it? John chapter 10. The Bible says at uh, verse 7, John chapter 10, and then we'll look at verse 7. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Notice how that relates to heaven itself uh, when we look at verse 1. Verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door unto the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. There's a reference there to the rapture. The porter opens that door up to his home and allows the sheep to come in if the shepherd calls you out by name. Okay, now let's go to Hebrews again. Hebrews chapter 10. So that is amazing about the veil. There's a reason why God did all of that. Verse 21, Hebrews chapter 10. And then uh, we'll look at verse 21. Understanding that all of this, notice, relates to priestly duties. See that? All of this relates to priestly duties, priestly activities. So notice right here the priestly duty and activity that we'll look at through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In verse 21, and having a high priest over the house of God. So we have a high priest over God's home and that is Jesus himself. Amen. House, remember from Hebrews chapter, I forgot what it was, four or six, four. yeah, four. Remember that the word house can refer to the people itself, like a household, or it can refer to the building itself or a location. Either way, it would work because Jesus Christ is the high priest over a location, heaven, but also his people. He's interceding on their behalf, and that is you and I. When we read this, it says 
Verse 22, because we have such a high priest, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So what we New Testament Christians can see from this passage that applies to us is that we got a high priest who's in charge of God's household so we can go close to God we can go close to Him with full assurance. No fear. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. We don't understand how holy God is. He is so holy, you deserve eternal damnation. Do you understand that? So holy that if you look at Him, you are to drop dead. Do you understand that? So because of only and only because of such a great high priest, we can be able to have assurance, not fear, when we approach God. Amen. And we can have assurance of faith. That means we can believe it. We know it to be so. Amen. This is not something that, oh, I hope so. No, we know so that uh, we have assurance and no fear to talk to Him. Amen. That's a wonderful thing. Right. I think we Christians tend to abuse that, don't we? Mm -hmm. uh, an example is uh, when you pray, a lot of times you give your moan and groans. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we take it, uh, we take too much advantage of it and spoiled it. We have to understand that God's holiness is so, if we truly understand what He really is, we should be more grateful in our prayer life when we do our assurance and comfort. Uh, uh, I think we abuse His grace too much. Uh, we're very spoiled people. And that includes yours truly. That's why I speak that very strongly. When we come to him in faith, why is that? In spite of his holiness and us in our sin. Because the next part reads, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Because our hearts itself is sprinkled by the blood of the lamb, by uh, the, sac uh, the sacrificial act that was committed and that cleanses all of our e inner doings of our evil conscience. But also our bodies itself receive washing of pure water. Why is such uh, wording used? Because the high priest did that with the Jews, remember. Remember from Hebrews 9, he had to sprinkle blood on them from innocent lamb sacrifice. So we got the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, His blood sprinkled on us so that we can have that access and fellowship to God, uh, with God. But recall also from Hebrews 9 that there was a cleansing, age, uh, cleansing water system. So He had to wash them with water. At the same time, we saved Christians. We not only received the sprinkling of the blood of Christ, but we also have our flesh itself washed by pure water. Amen. Now, uh, what are these things that can wash us? Well, first let me tell you the misunderstanding that people think wrongly. This is sprinkling baptism. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is the proof text that R.C. Sproul could use oh, that we can have baby sprinkling, you know, or sprinkling baptism, either or, whatever he believes in. Now that is... Uh, that is full baloney because uh, you might say, why is that? Because one, notice right here what the sprinkling is, your heart in an evil conscience. Unless you can pull out everybody's heart and then put sprinkling on it, and that Catholic priest puts it back in your body, or a Calvinist priest, either or, then, <laughs> then I'll believe you. But obviously we know this is not some kind of physical, see that? It's not some kind of physical thing you do yeah, here. This has got to be all a spiritual transaction. Now, the evidence is when we look at Ezekiel 36 and Titus 3. Ezekiel 36 and then uh, Titus 3. Notice that the heart's being sprinkled, all right, or God dealing with the hearts where he can cleanse it is all a spiritual transaction when we look at other cases in the Bible that shows how God cleanses the heart with washing. Look at Titus chapter 3 and Ezekiel chapter 36. First of all, notice in Ezekiel 36 what God will do with the nation of Israel in verse 25. Verse 25. 
Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols, which will I cleanse you. See, I told you so. You can get sprinkling baptism right here, and then you'll get your sins washed. Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you. What do you think that is? That's a spiritual transaction, obviously. Unless, uh, you want, unless you want to take out butcher knives and dismember people's bodies during some sprinkling ceremony, then you can go for it. But obviously that's not the case. This is a spiritual transaction. But look at Titus 3. Titus chapter 3. And then verse 5. Notice that this washing has to do with a spiritual transaction again. Titus 3, 5. For by works of righteousness, which, uh, not by, excuse me, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the what? Yeah. Washing of regeneration. We know that's spiritual regeneration. And renewing of the what? Okay, that's very plain. That is spiritual. It's all done by the Holy Spirit. Now we go to, uh, I, I forgot, Ephesians, Ephesians 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 5, excuse me, Ephesians chapter 5. So think about this. Remember Hebrews 10, sprinkling of the blood, right, of animals. So we receive that, but also we get the washing of water. Now I'm going to explain to you how this is done then. So according to uh, Hebrews 10, I'm not going to uh, turn to that verse because... I mention it quite often, but write down 1 John. Obviously, the passage you can think of is 1 John 1, 7 through 10. 1 John 1, 7 through 9, excuse me. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. I'll write it up there too, just in case. But recall, when we get that uh, blood being sprinkled, notice that the author in Hebrews 10, it's a present tense. See that? It's not a past tense. Let me repeat that again. It's a present tense, not a past tense. What I'm trying to drive at is this. The author of Hebrews is trying to point out to New Testament Christians how they can apply it is that presently we can go to God and speak to him boldly in heaven. In spite of how much we sin in our fellowship, sin in our walk, we can claim the blood of Jesus Christ that can wash away the sins of our fellowship and walk. I'm not talking about our salvation, but our fellowship and walk. If the author of Hebrews is using uh, those present tense forms, not in a way for uh, fellowship and walk, but rather salvation, then the, sprinkling, then the sprinkling of the blood will not be concerning our fellowship and walk, but rather our salvation itself. But from what I see in Hebrews 10, it seems pretty plain to me. If New Testament Christians want to doctrinally apply this in present tense, it makes way more sense with our fellowship and walk with Jesus Christ. So we get that sprinkling of the blood on us. That's why we got boldness and access to converse with him. So when we go to Hebrew, uh, first, uh, 1 John 1, uh, I, again, the passage is 1 John 1 and 7 and 9, but then... We now go to Ephesians chapter 5. And Ephesians 5, notice right here, the washing agent is when we receive the word of God. When we receive that word of God and constantly read it, it cleanses us. It's a present sanctification, all right? Not a past sanctification. Look at Ephesians 5, 26. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the what? Word. By the Word. So when we constantly read the Word of God, it cleanses us present tense. There's another passage. Uh, we can go to John 17. Go to John 17. Mm -hmm. Amen. Jesus Christ mentions them about, uh, excuse me, Jesus Christ mentions that sanctification present tense, mm -hmm. cleansing, washing present tense, mm -hmm. is done by the Word of God the Word of God. So we can come to Him in boldness, 
receiving that spiritual cleansing because one, we got the sprinkling of the blood of Christ through animals and then the washing of water because of his spiritual word. So that's the reason why it's important to constantly confess your sins under the blood when you pray and to constantly read his word. That way, when you pray to him, you're clean. George Mueller, one of the greatest prayer warriors, believed strongly in reading the Bible before praying, actually, believe it or not. When you pray, quite often the habit is we confess our sin first, right? Before we pray the other request, so that God can hear us, so that our fellowship is not broken. It can be repaired again. So that's the reason why the Word of God is important as well as confessing sins under the blood. John chapter 17 and verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is true. So you receive a present sanctification, present tense, because of the Word of God. Okay, go to Hebrews 10. That was probably the most important devotional application you want to learn from tonight's lesson. Amen. Is to always practice. That's why it's very important to practice from these two verses that we saw. Is a reading of God's Word and also a confession of of sins before you can boldly come before him in prayer. But for you to use your wrong prayers already to begin with, with moaning and groaning and abusing, you know, uh, abusing uh, the access without confessing or reading his word, your walk, your life, that's why you have no peace. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. All right, go to Hebrews 10. See your life change maybe through doing those two means first. Amen. I would recommend that. All right, Try that way first before you pray. Maybe the heart will be right with God beforehand, right? Okay, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10, and then we'll go to verse 23. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. So the author is arguing right here. Uh, concerning about what we can learn about is that's why we have to uh, hold fast our faith, what we profess to believe in without, uh, with, without wavering, without shaking, because God promised to us and we have to, uh, so we can hold on to that with full assurance. Now, what I'm going to do is even though I'm talking about us, I want to apply uh, tribulation saints first, tribulation Amen. Jews. Amen. Then we'll jump to the Christian. All right, I decided to do it that way. But first, let's go by context of the tribulation Jew from looking at verse 22 through 25, okay? 22, we can obviously guess that the tribulation Jews can practice the same thing like we do, right? So they can confess their sins because 1 John 1 if it is a tribulation epistle, then they can claim that, right? Confession of sins. And then obviously they have the Word of God with them, so then they can just constantly read the Bible. Receive that cleansing agent, and then they can have boldness to come to Him. So that's not a problem with Hebrews 10.22. But then 23 through 25, what will that mean? So then 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. In other words, I already explained verse 23, so now let's explain verse 24. The author is urging that we all consider each other. That's important, consider, yeah. all right? Not put on a shelf or someday I'll pray for you or, you know, I'll pop up in a blue moon or, oh, I remember you, brother and sister. No, 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 we got to keep each other in mind. Mm -hmm. Already you can see a Christian application, but let's concentrate the tribulation for now, all right? So then we have to provoke each other. We got to motivate Amen. each other with so much love because we love each other. Yeah. So we have to provoke, motivate each other to love one another and to do good works for God. We have, to, uh, we have to do a lot of work for Him that will please Him. That's why we can't forsake our assembling at verse 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. That's why the author urges we cannot skip church. That's, right. That's what it means. Yeah. Forsaking the assembling of ourselves together means do not 
forsake, that means to abandon. I remember what evangelist uh, Spurgeon, evangelist Dave Spurgeon said, I like that word forsake, what it means, abandon. I like that word. It makes us think about that. I was like, so do you want to abandon your brother and sister when you don't come to church? It's like, phew, good stuff, you know. I don't know if he'll do that, you know, at our revival meeting, so our next revival meeting, but we'll see. But anyway, he says, uh, the author points out you can't abandon whenever we come together. That's assemble. So think about it. When do we assemble? Not Sunday main service. When do believers assemble? That means every time we meet. So, God, so the author urges that we don't abandon that. We don't get rid of that. And he says right here, just like some people are doing at the middle of verse 25, as the manner of some is. Why? Because the next part of verse 25, but exhorting one another and so much the more as he see the day approaching. Because the author says that when we meet together, it's our exhortation. That's our motivation. Exhortation can even include rebuking, but this rebuke is inclusive with motivation. That's why it matches with verse 24. The author is urging that we need to inspire, we need to motivate each other. Look, how are you going to motivate each other without church? Church is uh, the number one thing that will motivate each other, believe it or not. Bible reading and prayer and uh, our relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing, don't get me wrong. However, the number one motivational thing is church. There's no doubt about that, hands down. Because you can come to church with a bad attitude and then just walk out all motivated all of a sudden. Right. It just happens like that. That's, uh, that's why the author urges about going to church because it, it motivates each other. So when you come to church, you have to motivate each other. So you have to consider, that's the context of verse 24, you got to look out for each other, all right? You don't have a clique, you don't have your group. I really don't like that too, and I don't want our church to be like that. If there's one thing I taught about this church, which I hope from my life, is every one of you is important Amen. to the body of Christ, and I am available for each and every one of you and want to help. Right. So it is very important that we have to consider one another, and we've got... And because of that, that's why we can motivate each other. That's why church is there, so that we can consider each other. But not even that. The author says you got to do it even more so. You got to do it even more so. Yeah. Why? Because the day is approaching. Yeah. Because as Jesus' coming is approaching even closer, hard times, you and I know, will become even harder. Temptation is stronger. Our flesh becomes weaker. That's why church is so important. The encouragement from each other is so important to prevent us from falling. All right, because I mentioned so much at a New Testament Christian application, I might as well do that, okay? So you understand the application for a New Testament Christian here. It's pretty obvious. So when Jesus comes for us at the rapture, we've got to make sure our church attendance is even higher. Does that make sense? Amen. That's what yeah. the verse is saying right there. there That's what the verse is saying right yeah, there. Our church yeah. attendance got to be higher. If that's people good. back at the Great Awakening revivals attended yeah. church more often yeah. than you and I did, then we're violating scripture. We ought to attend church more than they do, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Now, the mid-acts, or people who don't mean to be hyper-dispensational, but they end up being hyper-dispensational because they have no church to go to and they whine and complain because no one wants to listen to them, so all they can do is become a loser, post a channel on YouTube, and then uh, grow out a farm and die over there. And then yeah. they think that you don't need a church building, you don't need to meet, because we are the, the church is the universal church, we are the body of Christ, so we don't, so we don't need that. Well, the thing is, when you use this verse, then some of them might say, well, that's a tribulation Jew context. That's not for us Christians. Now, one is this. I don't care even if that's doctrinally for tribulation Jews. You see a lot of truth for New Testament Christian here spiritually anyways. Number two, Paul, who wrote this, didn't think so either. Notice how he used this. When he wrote Hebrews 10.25, it matches perfectly to his recollection of what he went through. Acts 11. Acts 11. You want a Christian application? Acts 11 said Christian here. All right. This is Christian. It actually says the word Christian. So this is 
This is applying to New Testament Christian. And Paul himself realized the importance of assembling together. Yeah. And why? Because that's where you exhort each other, motivate each other. Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11, verse 23, verse 23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and what? He exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. See, they're trying to get close to God. Look at verse uh, 26. And when he had found, uh, this happened where? This happened in a church, in an assembly in Antioch. Verse 26 is more plain. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they what? Assembled themselves with the church. And whole year. Whole year. And taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Amen. Now, the Christian first lesson should be from this case then here, right. if that's where they're first called Christian. Are you a Christian? Are you a follower of Christ? Then what's the tendency? You meet together. You assemble. Yeah. Acts eleven twenty six. All right? So if you see some loser online saying that you don't need to go to church and stuff like that, or uh, no, don't go to church. <laughs> they discourage you from going to church and they call themselves a Christian. They ain't a Christian. That's right. All right, go to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, now let's look at other passages as well. So, uh, man, we got so many good New Testament Christian promises here from this we can glean here. So another one is Philippians Chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2. Now notice how this all lines up. The, the, the author of Hebrews is lining up perfectly well with Paul. Yeah. So I, there's a, uh, we see right here, if it's the same author, that would make the most sense. Look at Philippians chapter 2. Notice in verse 16, verse 16, uh, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice you, with you all. Remember what the author of Hebrews said at Hebrews 10, 23, hold fast to your faith. That matches with Philippians 2. You hold fast because of the service of faith, for the sake of faith. Remember Hebrews 10? It said that uh, because the day is approaching, that's why you have to hold forth. Yeah. Look, Philippians 2 says the day of Christ is coming. That's why I have to hold forth as long as I can. Here's another one. Let's go to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Let's see right here. Verse 27, Philippians 1, verse 27. The Bible says, Only let your conversation as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs, that ye stand fast in one spirit, yeah. with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Yeah. See how that wording matches with Hebrews 10 about holding fast yeah. to the faith? Paul urges to strive together for the faith and to stand fast. Another one, uh, which I neglected, is Ephesians, excuse me, Ephesians chapter mm, 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Now remember in Hebrews chapter 10, that's why we can draw near in full assurance having the uh, with that blood sprinkled on us, right? So we have access to God. Paul, he mentions that same thing at Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 12. In verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Amen. See, that matches well with Hebrews chapter 10, uh, having the assurance of faith. That way we have access to him. Notice how this matches with Ephesians 2, where he talks about the blood. And the blood provided us the access. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 2. Yeah, Notice right here in uh, verse, uh, Ephesians chapter 2. And then uh, verse 7, thank you. Verse, 
Or is Ephesians 1, 7? Oh, yeah, 1, 7, yeah. 1, 7? No, we're, we're, it'll be Ephesians 2. It'll be Ephesians 2, verse 13. Verse 13. Chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Notice right here in verse 18. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Why? Because of that blood. That's why we receive that. So this matches very well with Hebrews 10, 22 through 25. See that? So for mid-Acts to say that this is only some tribulation Jew application, it won't make sense when you look at Pauline epistles. Right. There's a lot of Pauline language here. You can look for Hebrews uh, 1 through, uh, you know, like 4, 3 and other passages. You can see clearly a tribulation Jewish flavor. Amen. You can see something that doesn't match with Paul. But in this passage right here, like Hebrews 2, I recall, and Hebrews 10, uh, Hebrews 10, the first half, they're strongly Pauline here. There's a strong Pauline application. Okay, this would uh, neglect to include, uh, we don't have to turn there, but it, because it will be chapters Romans 12 and 13. Romans 12 and 13. But over there, Paul points out works that we're supposed to do. And we have to encourage, provoke each other to do so. Why? Because Jesus Christ's coming is at hand. So Romans 12 to 13 shows everything about we have to love each other and provoke each other to do good works. That matches with Hebrews 10.24. Now, the last thing I want to show, so we get a lot of Christian gleanings here. See that? Yeah. These match a lot with Pauline verses. Mm -hmm. The last thing, this is my favorite, all right? You're going to like this. If you don't like this, there's something wrong with you, I think, okay? <laughs> But in Hebrews 10, 23, for he is faithful that promised, right? Yeah. So we can hold fast to what we got, what we believe in, all right? We can encourage each other, keep serving God, not get swayed by the world, by our flesh. And we can have that peace with God. Why? Why don't you and I have a good reason to be discouraged? The reason why is because he promised you and I. He promised you and I, so we, so we keep striving, holding fast to it. We're not going to let any, our faith waver on his promise. But holding to his promise, that's why we know that we'll be all right. And he's faithful to perform that promise. He is faithful. So even though there's a long length of time or you don't feel it right now, guess what? He is faithful, okay? It's like the same thing if you had a spouse and then you're suspect, if the spouse is faithful to you and only to you, sometimes it's always possible for that spouse to not feel like that the person is being faithful to him or her, right? I don't know if that made any sense to you. But the point is that you can't rely on feelings to believe that the, your lover is being faithful to you or not. All right? It won't change the fact. Fact is, he is faithful, even if you don't feel like he is faithful. Yeah. Bless God. Amen. All right, 1 Thessalonians 5. I don't care how you feel, your feelings are wrong, okay? The Word of God says otherwise because He's faithful in that He promised. That's a good verse. Faithful to that He promised. You want to memorize that one. And that matches very well when we look at uh, 1 Thessalonians and chapter 5. Man, we got a great God at verse 24. I love this verse. Faithful is he that calleth you who what? So we'll who also Amen. will do it. That's a good verse to memorize. Yeah. He's faithful to keep his word and he will do it for you. Yeah. Even if you don't feel it, he will do it. It doesn't change the fact in spite of your feeling. All right, let's go to Hebrews chapter 10. So now we understand the important Christian application, which was a huge blessing. Now let's look at the tribulation application. The tribulation application, uh, which is a no-brainer, you can guess, is, uh, we already explained verse 22, but verse 23, that, remember they have to hold fast, remember that? Endure to the end. So then this is for their salvation here. So they have to hold on to their faith in their salvation and realize that God promised to them, and he's faithful in his promise. Hey, make sure you endure because I'm going to bless you with this. I'm going to reward you with this. You will have access to the tree of life. If you endure, then I will give you a crown of life, etc., etc. So they have to hold on to that promise that is given in Revelation. 
chapter 2 and 3, Revelation 2 and 3. Now, the Christian church is not to forsake the assembly. But also, notice right here, the tribulation. That, in, that is inclusive to the tribulation saints. They cannot forsake the assembling themselves. See that? So if you want to prepare for the tribulation, let me tell you something if you're a trip prepper. You ready for this? Attend church. Come on. Yeah. That's good. If, you're, if, you, if you want to attack the Antichrist, attack the devil's system, endure through the tribulation and conquer them, and you know all the conspiracies, if you don't attend church, then you're swayed by them. You're messed up by them. Why? Because the Bible is speaking to tribulation Jews, don't forsake the assembly. Why? Because persecution from the... Uh, I'll explain that part later, all right? But the point is that they're not supposed to forsake it. They're supposed to attend so they're a church too. That's why Revelation, right? Book of end times, correct? Yeah. It is a book about end times. So it is natural that a book about end times, that these churches here will have a end time application. Mm -hmm. So notice right here, tribulation saints have their churches ongoing during end times. And God gave a promise to each and every one of these seven churches in Revelation during the end times. Look at his promises that he gave to them. So they have to remember his promise. Verse 7, for example, to the church of Ephesus, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So he's faithful to that promise. That's why they have to hold fast to that, resist the Antichrist, not listen to his false religion, his temptation, so that they can have access to that tree of life. They have to remember that. Look at uh, verse 11, uh, verse 10 and 11, verse 10 and 11. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Verse 11, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. He promised them they will not burn in hell. He promised them that he will give them a crown of life. Notice verse 17, another promise to the church of uh, Pergamos that he'll give them a white stone hidden manna. Notice uh, right here at verse uh, 28, he's going to give them the morning star. He's going to give verse 26, 27, rulership over nations. So that's the same thing like Christians who receive that promise. You stay faithful to him, he will give you a, a rulership on this earth. Uh, let's see right here, chapter 3, and then uh, verse 10, chapter 3, verse 10, he'll keep them from the hour of temptation. So some kind of trying time period that could happen during the tribulation. He also says right here, verse 12, he's going to uh, make a pillar a temp uh, in the temple, their new name. Verse 21, he'll give them a seat in the throne. He'll give them a th seat in the throne. So notice right here, they re tribulation saints receive plenty of promises as well for their churches during the end times. Now, when you look back at Hebrews chapter 10, another thing here, so they are not su for, supposed to forsake their gathering together. Why is that? Because right here in verse 24, 25, notice right here that attendance, their gathering, is performed so that they can keep each other encouraged. Why? Because it's so obvious during the tribulation, there's so much hell on earth, persecution, the Antichrist's job is to wear out the saints, to wear them out, to discourage them. So God is urging the importance that they have to keep meeting together so that what? They can build up the resilience against the Antichrist. They can encourage each other. I mean, they're going to need all of that. So look at Daniel chapter 7. Let's look at the book of Daniel chapter 7. And then the other one is Matthew 24. Matthew 24. And we'll close it here, all right? Hope you enjoy tonight's Bible study. Daniel 7 and Matthew 24. Notice right here, the Antichrist's job and the tribulation timeline is a time where their love will wax cold. 
So that's why uh, the author of Hebrews says provoke each other to love. Their spirituality is in danger, so they need to encourage each other. They will be, co be constantly discouraged by the Antichrist. So look at Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Notice what the Antichrist will do, that little horn. He's going to wear out the saints. That's his job. Notice uh, at verse, oh, where are you? I just lost that verse. Uh, verse 25, verse 25. And he, the Antichrist, shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. See that? His job is to wear them out. Go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Remember, the context is tribulation in Matthew 24. And notice right here what Jesus warned. Jesus warned at verse 12, verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's why, verse 13, you must endure. See, that matches perfectly with Hebrews 10, where the author is saying right here, that's why you have to hold fast, yeah. so endure to the end, where you provoke each other in love. That matches well with Matthew 24. So notice right here, clearly, when you look at these verses, there is no doubt at Hebrews 10, a dimensional form of dispensationalism. There's clearly no doubt about that. You see Christians where they can strongly apply these things to themselves as well as tribulation Jews. So basically, what do you think the point is? I think the point is I think God thinks that church is very important. Right. Church attendance is very important. And people who tell you otherwise, they're just demon-possessed or full of the devil. You've got to be careful of that. Uh, yeah. these, these dangerous wolves online trying to get people into the Internet, the Internet. Here's the funny thing. I like to add this, all right? You want me to talk about eschatology? You want me to tell you about conspiracies and stuff like that? There is no doubt AI is going to be an integral factor with the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. What good will online do for you then when AI takes it over? At that time, maybe you'll see this is more important exactly, yeah. than online. Because online could be used by algorithms from the Antichrist to get you deceived into something where you think it's a truth. Yes. All right, then. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. Open our eyes more to the truth of your scripture and then help us to spiritually grow and then get a blessing out of these things and practice them out of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.